Okay, so first of all, this is the second time today I'm recording this video because the first time, unfortunately, had no audio. So <clears throat> there you go. Sometimes things have to be done the second time under these circumstances. So first of all, a little bit about the Haftarah in general, and then we'll read it once regular, once with a melody and talk about the grammar. So why do we read the Haftarah? So if you go and ask around, the common answer you would get from the rabbi at your local synagogue or, or other people is that there was a period of time usually associated with Antiochus the uh, fourth, the Antiochus of Hanukkah, Antiochus Epiphanes, um, in which Jews were not permitted to assemble and read from the Torah. Uh, so they decided instead of reading from the Torah, they're going to read from the prophets. So the regular answer, the common answer, the answer that I knew as a child was this answer. And it is mentioned in books, and, and people still uh, mention that answer as, as maybe the most common answer. However, think about it. This is hardly a convincing answer, because if indeed at a certain time, let's say Antiochus or any other despot for that matter, would decide, oh, you Jews, you must not read from the Torah, do you think they would allow the Jews to read from the prophets? It wouldn't make much sense for, for a tyrant to say, listen, I don't like your scripture. You can read from certain books of it, but you cannot read from other books of it. You must not read from the Torah, but you may read from the other books of your scriptures. You may read from the prophets. It doesn't make a lot of sense for anyone to go into such a resolution. Let's say you want to persecute a religion, you don't say, oh, read from these books, don't read from these books within the, the canon of that religion. You say, oh, no assemblies, no reading, no teaching, no nothing. <clears throat> Okay, so it doesn't make a lot of sense. And next week we'll present a different idea about how come we read the aft, the Haftarah. What is the reason we read a selected reading from the prophets uh, instead of, or alongside, not instead, obviously, after the reading of the portion of the Torah. Uh, the weekly portion is the portion of Yi Torah, where we have the Ten Commandments and other important things. And... This is the first verse of the Haftarah. I'm going to read it once regular, once with a melody, and then talk a little bit about the grammar and add a question about the connection between the weekly portion of Yitro and the prophets. <clears throat> so, Bishnat, oh, once regular. Bishnat Mot HaMelech Uziyahu Va'er et Adonai Yoshev al Kiseh Ram Venisa Veshulav Meleim et Haheichal. And now with a melody. Bishnat Mot Hamelech Uziahu Vaer et Adonai Yosheb al Kise Ram Venisa Veshulav Meleim et Haheichal. I'm a little bit, uh, I have a cold, so still might not be the best singing. And let's see a few grammatical issues. So we have Bishnat Mot. Both of these forms are construct forms of the nouns. So the regular absolute form of the word Shinat is Shana. That would be year. Shana, year. Shinat means year of, the, instead of the patach, the, instead of the kamatz hey at the end, we see a patach tav, okay, bishnat, that's one. The other is mot instead of mavet, okay, mavet, instead of mavet, we have mot, mavet is death, mot is uh, the construct form of the word. So in the year of, the death of, King Uzziah, this is a, a multiple construct chain. When we have an of relationship, it doesn't have to be just between two nouns. It may exceed two nouns. Va'er'e et Adonai Yoshev al-Kiseh Ram 
ושולב מלאים את ההיכל. Both the word kiseh and the word heichal come to us from the Akkadian language. Akkadian is what we generally call the language that was spoken in Mesopotamia in the northern part. That's the Assyrian. And in the southern part, it is the Babylonian. It should be said that sometimes Assyrian is, uh, in earlier books, is referring to um, into uh, referring to Aramaic, okay? But Assyrian is the northern dialect of what we generally refer to as Akkadian. Kise has a dagesh in the Samech, probably because of a reish that assimilated into the Samech. We know equivalent words from the Arabic and from Aramaic uh, that uh, have the reish there, and we know it is a general phenomenon when that the reish assimilates into the following consonant in Hebrew. So we have um, other forms where we see this equivalence between Hebrew with that do not have that reish in Aramaic or Arabic words, which do. The word heichal is also interesting. Uh, based on the Akkadian, as I said, ekal or ekalum or ekalim, these are the case endings of, of the word, marking the syntactical uh, structure or the syntactical function of that word. Originally, the word ekal comes to the Akkadian from the Sumerian, which wasn't even a Semitic language. Originally in Sumerian, e. Gal e means cows, and gal means big. So e gal big house. Okay, that's palace. The palace of the Lord is obviously the temple. So that's the heichal. The big house is the palace. The big man is the king. So in Akkadian, uh, king in Sumerian, I mean king is lugal. The convention has. Uh, Sumerian, Sumerian written in capital letters, in uppercase letters. Uh, another interesting form, Mele'im. So, Mele'im, you know what? Another remark, interesting remark about Kise. Biblical Hebrew, throne. Modern Hebrew, chair. So, I'm sitting on a modern Hebrew Kise. This is not biblical Hebrew kise, but it is modern Hebrew kise, modern Hebrew seat or chair. Biblical Hebrew, a chair that has authority, a seat that has authority. So a king has a kise, a judge may have a kise, but regular people like yours truly have just a modern Hebrew sense of a kise, a chair. Meleim. Uh, the, the singular is male, and male is a stative verb, a verb that expresses <clears throat> a state of being. Those verbs which express a state of being in the third person masculine singular, kalkata, take the a vowel, not the a vowel, as opposed to katav, shomar, that take the a, male, kaved, yare. They take the e and they express the state of being. Because they express the state of being, they are used oftentimes in a more adjectival way because they are not describing a dynamic action, but rather a state of being. So male can be used as a participle or as an adjective, even though it is a uh, verb, okay, because it's a stative verb. So, one of the commandments, um, moving on to the question that I'm leaving you with, one of the commandments is to keep the Sabbath holy, right? And either shamor et yom ha-shabbat legacho or zachor et yom ha-shabbat legacho, depending on the version of the Ten Commandments we're reading, either in Exodus or in Deuteronomy, which prophet Demanded, demanded to uh, keep the Sabbath holy, okay? To keep the Sabbath sanctified. And that's it for today.